Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Books in the World. I am Madeline Mealy Holt, and today we are going to talk with Jacqueline Machard. Hi, Jackie. Hi. Thank you for coming. I'm delighted to be able to come. Come down the street. Come down the street, <laughs> Jackie. my house. Jackie lives in Brewster after living most of her life in the Midwest. Um, Books in the World, uh, usually, uh, Books in the World has been on TV, cable TV, longer than any other cable TV book show in the United States. And we usually focus on one book, usually the author's latest book. Um, Jackie has written more than 20 books, and her first book is the very well-known Deep End of the Ocean which was chosen by Oprah Winfrey as uh, her very first Oprah Book Club book. And I can imagine being you and having this happen to you, but it, it, it is a wonderful story, and congratulations and everything that followed. It was a long time ago, <laughs> it was a long 20 time years ago. ago. It was a long time ago, but as I mentioned to you, I picked up Deep End of the Ocean um, a couple of months ago, and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I it led me to think I have the opportunity to talk to Jacqueline Machard and while she has a lot of interesting things in her life some good and not so good a lot of success a lot of wonderful personal stories about the nine children that you have um, I really wanted to talk to you about writing and you agreed and so we we narrowed or I started narrowing it down to three areas of, um, of writing that I thought uh, were especially meaningful when I read Deep of the Ocean. And one was the, um, the emotion that went into writing that book, and we're going to talk about that in, the, in a minute. And then the other was um, uh, writing a, a good plot and making sure you've finished the story and tell me what the other one was that ending we took. Ending it. Ending it. Yes. Ending it. Ending getting it. out of town. Getting out of town, right. So as much as we'd like to hear all about Oprah and making movies out of your books and all those good things, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this over to you in a minute, but I did want people to know that Deep End of the Ocean had something like five million copies in print mm -hmm. at one point. And, um, there are over a hundred listings in the Clams catalog for your other books and all your books. So you have been on the bestseller list for 29, 30 weeks or something like that right. with, with that particular book. Um, and other books, but not at number one. Not at number one. No. But it, it is just uh, a great success story. And, and having read what I've read, you deserve it, and people, if they're looking for anything to read, they should read your book, so I can't say enough. <laughs> you know. So let's talk about um, writing and start with that emotional impact of um, writing about uh, Beth Capadora, for example. You, you have to, in order to write about a person who's in trouble, you have to imagine yourself in trouble. At the time, since I had been widowed, not long before I began writing The Deep End of the Ocean, not at all long before, I was widowed in my 30s. And I tried to imagine a different kind of grief, the grief of losing a child. And of course, the grief of losing a, a husband, even though it's another uh, even though it's extraordinary, it's another adult. It's not the same thing, it's not comparable at all. Whenever you try to work your way into a character, you have to imagine being that character and imagine being able to experience that character's grief. It sounds easy, mm. but it's not easy, and it's also very painful to do. That, it's very painful right. to experience those feelings in order to write them down. And you think, wow, I'm really a cheap date, you know, I cry over my own prose. But you cry because you've abandoned yourself so fully, you've surrendered yourself so fully to those characters that the things that they're going through are the things that you, by extension, are going through. Well, I, I didn't bring the quotes um, right this minute, but I'm thinking of right at the beginning, um, Ben is kidnapped. Her three-year-old son mm -hmm. is kidnapped from a hotel lobby. And after some 
hours and hours of police trying to figure out what's going on, uh, her husband says, well, I think we better go home now. And he says, you'll come around or something like that. He says you'll survive, and she <laughs> says I don't want to survive. I I, I don't want to like survive. Even reading ben. that was yeah. to me was like a sock in the gut. To to have anyone say to you, you'll come around, or to have the reporters on the next page of that particular story saying, oh, just get in touch with me, and um, we'll figure out how to put this in Parade Magazine or USA Today or something, and and it'll all be good. And you somehow made me feel that I was there and that I was, I was getting a punch in the gut. <laughs> People really didn't like that character because she was depressed, because she was unwilling to believe that there would be a life after this loss that would in some way approximate normal. And I knew as a mother, I knew that there would never be, if I lost a child, there would never be a life that would approximate before. There would definitely be a before and after for, <coughs> for always. Mm. And that uh, to try to pretend otherwise was to make an inauthentic character. Well, I wasn't going to go here with this comment, but with the movie, um, with Michelle Pfeiffer, um, they made a movie out of this book. And I was wondering what you thought of the way she acted that role. I thought she was terrific. Yeah. I yeah. thought she was absolutely terrific. Yeah. And... Uh, I couldn't have thought of anyone who could have inhabited Beth uh, in a better way than she did. And of course, she's a mom yeah. and has, uh, she is an extraordinary craftsman, but also understood that book at its deepest level. She was the one who chose to make that movie and she was the co-producer of it. Okay, I thought so. I, I did enjoy her very much. It was it was hard to watch though. I mean, she's very edgy and it, she never let up. But when you're talking about going through all this emotion as a writer, now you only that's only one character that we've mm -hmm. talked about. You have to put yourself in her husband's role, her children. Um, <laughs> if you want to mention what happens with her children, and I even wanted to ask you about how much research might have gone into the child psychology issues of what were going, was going on. Uh, well, especially with the one teenage son who was really, the older teenage boy was really the lost boy in mm -hmm. the story because Ben, who ultimately, I mean, this is no spoiler for those of you who haven't read the book, is that Ben returns to his family, is returned to his family. That happens in the first few pages. Right. And, uh, but it's the older brother who is responsible for him getting lost, or feels he is. That's right. That who's right. really lost, and who the story is really about trying him trying to be, uh, to allow himself to be forgiven. And it's sometimes difficult for you to allow yourself to be forgiven. And in every book that I've ever written, and I think in every good book, there are always there's always a character who has done wrong and uh, and wishes to be forgiven or who has a secret and that's the way that it's it's true in everyone's life mm -hmm. that's the way that that characters become genuine is because the reader is let in on that sort of special secret if you will do you have any tips for writing men I mean her husband is just as well developed as uh as she is. You mean as a woman? As a woman writing about uh, husbands or any men, or maybe you want to mention any of your other books. I, I have written from, I have, my most recent book, which is called Two of By Sea, was written entirely from the point of view of a man in his 40s. And I had to inhabit that man's spirit. And so I had to study my brother, my husband, and my for, I have five sons, so I have a lot of research material available to me about the different ways in which men and women react to things. Some of the human palette of emotion is common to everyone, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. but there are the superficial reactions are very different for men and for women, and so it's something that you do as a form of research. My books are not really historical fiction or science fiction in the sense they're called realistic contemporary fiction. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And so the research into systems and, uh, and institutions is perhaps not so great as the research just into human behavior. Well, you did a good job, I'll tell you, because the, the, um, the setting is timeless, I thought, in Deep End of the Ocean. It's 20 years later. It's not any different, you know. It didn't seem could have happened yesterday. And I only write my books in three places: <laughs> uh, Chicago, where I grew up; uh, Wisconsin, where I lived for 30 years; and Cape Cod, <laughs> because those are the places that I know about. Now, yeah. the characters in the books sometimes they go to Italy or they go to England uh, because I've been there. But I am not one of the writers who, like Jody Pico or something picks out an environment mm. for characters and then goes and experiences that environment. I, all of the settings for my books are fictitious. It's a west side of Chicago of the imagination. You know, I grew up in the Italian neighborhood on the west side of Chicago and uh, it's a west side of the imagination. It's a Madison, Wisconsin of the imagination, a Cape Cod of the imagination. And that's what people get mad about. When they write to you, they, they're not mad about the things that happen to these poor characters or anything. They're mad about the fact that they write to me and say, there was never a Mr. Chicken on the corner of Grand Avenue and 12th Street. <laughs> That's what they're mad about <laughs> is because they've been violated in some primary way oh that way. Goodness. Well, we talked about um, writing a plot and never letting go of it until it is really finished. Do you want to go on that subject? Plot I is the most difficult thing for me. I have a great friend. I call her my app because I say to her, and she's also a novelist. Her name is Ann Garvin. She's best known for a book called On Maggie's Watch. And she is a wonderful plotter. And I'm very good at realizing characters, but making a plot twist and turn is difficult for me to achieve. And I have this rule in my mind. There have to be 10 plot twists in every story, 10 or 11 plot twists in every story. I don't know why I believe that, but I believe that it's true, and I try to construct my books that way. And, so, and readers, dis, readers expect something to be unexpected. They don't want to read a story just to experience emotion. That there has to be a plot in which something happens. Mm -hmm. Stephen King says this all the time, that character is important, but plot is the reigning queen. And I believe that too. It's difficult to come up with a plot that is satisfying, that lasts until the end, that is not phony, and that the reader can't see through. Wow. <laughs> bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Very good. But not not everyone succeeds uh, obviously we've talked about a few authors and I guess we won't name them um, but they are even the best and people who are the most well known and as I mentioned to you book clubs discussions always pick it out right away I didn't like the ending I didn't like the ending so. it's true because even very good writers sometimes say I got to where I ran out of incidents and I couldn't think how to get out of it. I couldn't think how to get out of town. And the impulse is just to say, okay, then everyone got run over by a truck. <laughs> you just, but you have to have an ending that does a number of things. Of course it has to answer all the questions and tie up all the loose ends of the plot, but it also has to contain something new and startling and satisfying that the reader who gets to the end earns like if you're eating a bran muffin. You can't just eat that bran muffin. You have to get a raisin every now and then. <laughs> and at the end is this glorious raisin that you have earned and it makes you feel, again, the best uh, thing that a writer can do is to make the reader feel included and smart. Okay. And when you get to the end of a story and you have that satisfying ending, the, the reader feels included and smart. But it's so difficult to create a good ending because the ending has to be fully as symphonic as the beginning is. Think about a good night kiss. 
okay? Mm -hmm. That's what stays with you. Mm. At the end of a date, you remember that kiss, you can feel it through the night and for days afterwards, it is the return of the reader to the world after the book. And it's difficult to leave a book. It's it difficult is. to leave a book it you've is. loved. Yeah, you don't want to read the next one. No, often. you don't. <laughs> you, know? you don't. You feel almost unfaithful. You mentioned that a lot of your readers of Deep End didn't buy your second book. Oh no, <laughs> they didn't want to leave the first one. No, behind. they didn't. And my second book, actually, um, the most wanted, has been the most critically acclaimed of any of my books. But uh, a lot of it, it sold nicely, but a lot of people thought. I'm just not going to be unfaithful to the Campadores <laughs> and read that other novel. Wow. I mean, I've written better books than The Deep End of the Ocean, but never one that has been so obviously so right. impactful on so many people's lives. So that leads us nicely into another topic that we were going to talk about, sequels. Um, I mean, here you go. If, if the ending is satisfying, and the reader has had a chance to say, aha, I knew that was coming, or I figured that out, or I might have guessed, or I should have guessed. What's the author supposed to do who wants to write a sequel? Well, or why generally an why? author should stop him or himself or herself <laughs> if he wants to write. If you've written a good standalone book, there's no reason oftentimes to write a sequel, and yet every writer I know, or when I teach seminars, or when I teach in uh, the MFA programs that I teach in, everybody wants to write a, a series. Everybody wants to write a book with sequels and, and uh, a third in a series. I guess that is because it's a guaranteed marketing stream and some sequels have turned out to be just tremendous with the, all of the books holding up mm -hmm. to the original book. What often happens, however, is that they're weaker. Mm -hmm. And there, you, you don't write a series just because you liked the characters so much and you want to go back to them. There has to be more business for those characters. They have to have unfinished business in order to even consider a sequel. You can't just say, well, I like Jack so much in Italy that now I'm going to take Jack to England and see what happens to him there. Because often there aren't as much authentic events in the capacity for a human character and it starts to feel fotched on. It starts to feel as though you're making it up just for the purposes of fiction. Hmm. So I guess it's true that if you, if there's a series character and this character is complicated, uh, I think of uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo yeah. is one in which the character really was complicated, yeah. had an enormous amount of stuff going on both in the external world and in her internal world that warranted a number of sequels that uh, were, were strange and filled with event, then yes, go ahead and explore mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But it can't just be the continued adventures unless it's going to be unless it's a young adult story in which uh, the, char the character's emotional life is much more important than the actual plot. Well, on, um, on the subject of sequels, you wrote about uh, one of the characters from Deep End was the son who you just mentioned. He was featured in the second book, at least the, uh, as far as I remember. Um, there was a sequel to The Deep End of the right. Ocean called No Time to no Wave Goodbye. Time to Goodbye. That okay. was... Uh, it was many years later, I, I think it was eight or nine years after The Deep End of the Ocean, and that book actually, it was actually a better book <laughs> in some ways. It was leaner and it was, uh, it had more interesting uh, parts of it and it got really good reviews, but it was because that character, Vincent, Right. Capadora was so complex and had so much emotional pain that it was almost difficult for him to, he grew up, he grew big, but he didn't really grow up. Mm -hmm. And it was only in that book that he finally came into his maturity. Is that the book that won the Orange Prize? 
I know you did win. I your didn't art. win it. I didn't I, win it. I was just shortlisted for oh, it. Okay. That was well, for my second right. novel. That's good enough. The most wanted. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I was very proud of that because yes. it's it's uh, an enormous uh, honor. Yes, the Orange Prize, in case people don't know and are looking for good books to read, is another wonderful book uh, book prize developed for women who write right. in English. In the, yeah, in English. yeah, it's given in the UK. And you get to go there even if you're just on the short list. And that's so much well. fun. But um, it, it did not win that year, but, uh, it, but it was shortlisted. And I was very proud of that. Uh, absolutely. So another topic that we've corresponded about is developing your writing style. And you have some tips for that. And you said it's a little controversial. It is a little controversial. I think that people want to find their own voices. And certainly they should want to find their own voice. But we really, I believe, we find our voices as writers by reading the writers that we love and copying them. Copy them. Just as we talked about Chagall, you know, copying uh, Picasso, or Picasso, Picasso copying, copying Chagall, and uh, Gauguin, mm -hmm. and um, the, you know, uh, Paul Cezanne going to the museum and literally studying the pictures of other uh, mass of masters so that he could copy their techniques. There's no shame in that. People sometimes even say to me, writers say to me, I don't like to read because I'm afraid that I'll be too influenced by another writer's voice. But if you are enormously drawn to another writer's voice, you're really finding your own voice within that writer's way of doing things. And there's no shame in, of course, not literally copying their, mm -hmm. their prose, mm -hmm. but in copying the ways that they do things and the ways that they say things is the way that you discover your own style. I've been enormously influenced by some writers that I continue to draw inspiration from. And as I said to you, they're writers whose books I've read more than once, more than twice, more than five times so because I'm going, going back. Well, some of them are obvious, like Jane Eyre. You know, <laughs> I read that many, many times. And my favorite book by Betty Smith, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which I think is sort of the great American novel. It's about everything. It's about love and life and art and poverty and, and, uh, and family and everything. Uh, True Grit by Charles Portis. Yep. And, uh, Anyone who wants to know about a character's voice should read this Pulitzer Prize winning novel. I mean, people say I saw the movie. It's not the same thing at all. It's an extraordinary book. Uh, and Truman Capote in Cold Blood is one of the books that not only was I, like everyone else who read it, I read it when I was a kid, uh, taken by the extraordinary way in which he treated the subject matter, but also the plain and clear way that such an erudite writer writes. And the, I can't think of anything more important for writers to learn than to be simple, Can to find just, a way to um, be simple. Take um, True Grit and give us two sentences about the plot and what you, or the characters, and what you think you took from that. True Grit is a story of a girl, she's 14 years old, who goes right. to the, at that time it was in Oklahoma, they called it the Indian Territory, to avenge her father's murder, to find the man who murdered her father, uh, an outlaw who murdered her father, and she enlists the help of a, of a sheriff, a very controversial uh, U.S. Marshal, in order to do that. And it's, a, it's an adventure story. It's a Western, but it also is a story about coming of age, mm -hmm. uh, a girl learning that she can be as powerful as any man, that she can learn to, that her, uh, her courage was undeniable, and even though people tried to tell her that what she wanted to do was impossible, she had grit so and found her way to that having read just 
a couple of your books, I'm trying to think through what you've just said. So you have characters who are facing challenges. You ha I'm trying to put your mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. I, I read Charlie Portis in order to develop my own style. So I think the narration is one thing. I, you do a, you know, you do a lot of storytelling. Um, what do you and voice. Uh, yeah. The voice uh, the voice of a book is both the voice of the narrator and the voice of the characters. It's the way in which the story is told. It's the choices in, and you can think of a book, if you think of a book that you love right now, regardless of who it's by, what you're often thinking about is, the char is that voice. Mm -hmm. The way the story sounds to the ear of the mind. Wow. Well, it's hard for me to say this, but we're almost out of time. And I do want to give you a chance to talk about what you're doing now. Um, what, what, I, I know there's so many things we could talk about. I, I, I wrote in my notes that if you haven't read Jackie Michard, read one, read them all. You'll always have something good to read. Um, there's a website called Quotable Somebody Somebody. There's a quotable Jackie Michard section. I don't even if you know, know I had this. no idea that that was there. A friend of mine just told me about this. There must be, I don't know, a hundred excerpts from Who knew? your books. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that I was quotable? So far as I know, the most uh, quoted line from any of my books is, cats regard people as warm-blooded furniture. <laughs> and that appears every place. But I'm well, working on a new novel, teaching, uh, raising my family, uh, enjoying, you know, living the crazy life on Cape Cod. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all your books. Thank you for having me. We have had such a good time getting to know each other. I want to urge everyone to really go to your libraries, go to your bookstores, read some of these good books if you want to. Um, if you're ever at a loss of what to read, go to the Oprah Book Club list. <laughs> Everybody from you, tremendous. the first one, Jane Hamilton, um, Isabella Allende, just wonderful storytellers. Thank you all so much for watching. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Good day. Good day.